Welcome everyone to this uh, edition of uh, Homestead Colloquium series. Uh, Homestead Colloquium is funded uh, by two research institutes, Center for Research and Embedded Systems, Ceres and Kaiser. And the theme of the colloquium is uh, embedded intelligent systems. We have distinguished speakers from all around the world. And it's my honor to introduce the speaker of today, Manfred Broy, who is an excellent, outstanding researcher in the field of cyber physical systems. Uh, he got his PhD in 1982 uh, on transformation of programs in parallel, which is, well, I think, a very innovative subject still. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he founded uh, the computer science department in Passau uh, after his PhD, and he became a full professor in 1983 already in uh, Passau. Then he moved to Munich to found, to found a new uh, <laughs> computer science department in Munich. And he became the dean of uh, the newly founded computer science department there. And uh, he has ever since been there. Uh, he has uh, been involved in lots of uh, initiatives uh, uh, related to embedded systems and cyber physical systems. Uh, if you look at his CV, there are tens of awards and, and medals and all sorts of uh, achievements uh, mentioned in his CV. I, I cannot uh, count them all here. Uh, he is a fellow of uh, Gesellschaft für Informatik uh, in, in Germany, which is the Association of Computer Science there. He is a fellow of uh, Max Planck Institute. As I said, lots of medals and awards. Uh, just look it up. Uh, and it's my honor to give you the floor. Manfred, please go ahead. Thank you very much for the invitation. I very much enjoyed to be here, in particular on, on a day with the weather like that. Um, it's my pleasure now to give you a presentation on uh, what I call modeling and I will explain what I mean by seamless modeling and I even will explain what I mean by cyber physical systems. Uh, perhaps let's start with this question, what is a cyber physical system? We discussed it already over the lunch a bit. Uh, that. Uh, some people are not sure whether cyber physical systems is not just a new term for embedded systems. Uh, if you look at the history of, of the field, perhaps it could to look at the history of systems engineering. Systems engineering uh, certainly started in the Second World War. We had the first more complicated multidisciplinary systems in the First World War at a time where software was not an issue. Uh, then in the 60s we had this notion of a mechatronic system and the definition from Wikipedia is mechatronics is a multidisciplinary field of engineering so it's like systems engineering that is to say it rejects splitting engineering into separate disciplines. Originally mechatronics is just included the combination of mechanics and electronics hence the word, the word is a combination of mechanics and electronics. And this is why I don't use the word a lot because today systems are much more determined by software than any other thing and therefore mechatronics is a bit uh, old-fashioned in the sense that it doesn't refer to the fact that we have a lot of software in the system. Then we have this notion of an embedded system according to Wikipedia, a computer system designed for specific control function within a larger, often, uh, larger system often with real-time computing constraints. And now you see why I found it a good idea to switch to cyber physical systems because here you find nothing which has to do with connectivity. And I think one of the big differences we see today for those systems that we have a lot of connectivity. Uh, the, the term cyber physical system was first coined in the US in a meeting by the National Science Foundation, people were discussing this notion and it says cyber physical systems are engineered systems that are built from and depend upon the synergy of computational and physical components. Emerging CPS will be coordinated, distributed and connected and must be robust and responsive. So as you see already a little bit of distribution and connectivity there, but it's not so much emphasized. The CPS of tomorrow will need to far exceed the systems of today in capability, adaptability, resilience, safety, security and usability. So it's, it's a step in the, in the connection to connectivity. I had the pleasure to run a project in Germany on cyber physical systems for the German Academy of Technical Sciences and we came up with a definition which uh, puts connectivity much more in the foreground. So we are saying 
And I think the rest of this is very similar to what we have seen, but we say that this are, are connected with one another in a global and in global network via digital communication facilities. Uh, use global available data and services have a series of dedicated multimodal human machine interfaces. So we were deciding to have a much broader understanding of cyber physical systems. And uh, the reason was that when we did that study, we, we came across the observation that this convergence of what was classically called embedded systems and let's just say the internet and um, our human-centered approach to that for instance the millions of smartphones and other devices which allow people to connect to the internet and via the internet to connect to a lot of physical devices is really most remarkable and will change our field considerably so the idea is uh, that we characterize also the systems not so much by the technical parts but also by the functionality and the fact that you can use devices here to uh, to get connected to uh, physical reality on a remote place say in South America is certainly an interesting uh, result of this convergence of embedded systems and uh, global networks. So we have a number of key properties and challenges when we deal with fiber physical systems and uh, I would say we are just at the beginning. The amount of possibilities we see by using those cyber physical systems is very hard to estimate. It's beyond our current imagination. Uh, and uh, it's interesting, it's also, uh, we are always at a point where we can do much more with the technology than we do today. Our limitations are just our imaginations, our ability to use the technology for these many purposes we can use it for. But of course there are a number of challenges there. Uh, we have to deal with the physicality. Uh, and I will talk, when I talk about modeling, I will talk about that. Uh, it's interesting, if you look at the history of computer science, and when I started in computer science in the 70s, uh, the major idea in the, 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 the key for, of the key people in computer science, for instance, under the heading structured programming, was to, to construct a very abstract understanding of programming and a very abstract understanding of models. For instance, time was considered as something sh which should not be visible in a program. Or the program should be independent of those physical things, should be very abstract things. But if we go back to cyber physical systems, uh, we have to deal with the real world in our programs and therefore time and also probability, for instance, which are uh, ways to understand our reality have to come back into the world of computer science. So we get what some people call real-world awareness in our system and we have to deal with real-time, with probability, but also with location and many other notions around that. And as I already told, we have to understand connectivity system of systems. Uh, that's one important additional aspect. If you look at the classical embedded systems, s they tend to be closed systems. Closed system meaning that they are not connected in a digital way to the outside, but rather controlling some physical parts of a device, maybe also having some uh, man-machine interface, but not exchanging data to the outside. Now they get open, uh, they get connected, and if we connect one system to the other, and one of those systems is connected to the internet, and the internet is connected to nearly all other systems, all our, our systems are connected. So we get what is called system of systems. Uh, we have to understand how to incorporate all kinds of services we find in the internet, and this leads to the notion of interoperability and service platforms. And the openness, of course, brings additional challenges like security, which if you look at the classical embedded systems, in many cases security is not a big issue. 
If you look at the car industry so far, or at least in the past, they haven't done much about security, just that they can, you can lock your car. Uh, but if you connect the car to the cloud, which is just happening now, then of course you get much more challenges in security. Human-centric engineering is an issue because what we also observe is these systems are closer to the human beings than any other technical systems we have seen so far. I always say it's closer to the heart of the people and I don't mean pacemakers. I mean that if you look at the way people use smartphones, we are already in a situation where they have kind of synergy with those devices and the way how they handle their everyday life. And we will have dynamic systems where things change interfaces, change architectures, change behavior, and we will have mobile systems uh, and space awareness. And we found that uh, a very fascinating way to look at the future of our field. And uh, we have these two sides of cyber physical systems. The internet becomes real world aware and embedded systems get connected to cloud services. Mm -hmm. These are main ways we understand cyber physical systems. Well, now we see how things change because we bring together two disciplines which are quite different. If you look at traditional embedded systems, as I said, they are closed, they are real-time uh, dependent, they con are connected to the physical, they are, have to be reliable, we have high safety requirements, low security requirements because they are closed and are connected to the outside. And if you look at service in the cloud, they are open, they have open interfaces, they have restricted availability, they are easy extendable, they have high interoperability, they have low safety requirements and high security requirements. And we have to bring those together, which means that we get smart cyber physical systems, like uh, assuming they are adaptive, context aware, to a certain way autonomous. We will go in the direct. I'm not talking about the big data in my talk, really. I just wanted to point out if you take the thousands of sensors you have, I shouldn't say thousands, millions of sensors you have around, even in a car, you have a lot of sensors. And assume you take all the, all the data you gather that way and you are able to bring it into the internet, which technically is not a problem, then you have a lots of possibility to use the data for many purposes, which is very close to the challenges of big data. We have these open interfaces, systems are dynamic, and we also have to talk about the tactile internet. What is tactile internet? It means it's a real-time usable internet. Today you don't have a guarantee of quality in how long the delay is when you uh, transfer a message. Uh, but now people are thinking about uh, could we also use the internet in connection with embedded systems even for the real-time calculations and then of course we need another type of uh, quality of service for the internet. So you see this brings a lot of challenges. Um, I will concentrate in my talk uh, about not so much talking about this vision uh, on cyber physical system, but rather uh, spend the rest of the talk on a much more yeah, theoretical, foundational question, namely how do we model those systems. So we need expressive and tractable modeling concepts. We have to, have to have a clear understanding of the relationship between modeling concepts. And now we are in the world where people <laughs> suggest and use models and I'm convinced that uh, our discipline, our field, if you look for it from an engineering perspective, it is a, to a large extent, it's a modeling field. What do we do if we uh, use computer science, if you write a program? A program is always a kind of a model. It models certain aspects of a domain of the real world. It can be very abstract, it can be very concrete, it can be close to physicality, uh, but it's always a model. And uh, the more complex the systems get, the, the more important it is to have the right models. And we have a number of modeling approaches around. Uh, a famous one is UML, but I believe that UML is just a step it's not even clear whether it's a step in the right direction, but it's a step which shows in what, can, what should be done, in a sense, and at the same time it also shows what is missing. 
So for instance, we have to have a clear understanding of relationship, be, relationship between modeling concepts. If you look at UML, it's very difficult to understand how a state chart relates to a class diagram. And it's a, if, if, you, if you have fun, if you want to have fun, then talk to one of these UML guys about that. And they have no idea. Because what is UML? It's just taking a number of existing modeling concepts and putting that together. So it's not uh, really a unified modeling language, it's, it's just a, uni a union of modeling concepts. But it's not integrated. So we need integration there. We need a notion and understanding of integration of these modeling concepts. We have to understand the tracing between the element of the modeling concepts, how they play together. We have to understand the expressive power. A key issue is modularity. I will give you my uh, interpretation of modularity and we need variety of forms of interpretation, namely I believe we need a denotational understanding of models, which basically means we have to have a mathematical representation of our modeling concepts. We need also a corresponding logical uh, representation and we need intuitive and tractable uh, representation for the human user, like graphics, diagrams or tables. Uh, what is seamless development? That's very simple. If you develop a system, let's assume you develop a uh, cyber-physical system, then of course uh, one way to think about it is that you go through a chain of models which capture certain aspects of those systems and so you need a high expressive power, a clear structure for which, which models are good. We, we have to capture all aspects in development that are relevant and we need a tight integration into the artifacts. So in a certain sense, if we document the development uh, to a large extent, we doc document the development by just documented, documenting the models. And the development steps should have a well-defined relationship. And that's, that's another issue. If you look at UML, just in it as, a, as, a, as an example of what we see in practice today, uh, UML is has a difficulty that you don't understand precisely how these different modeling concepts are related. But even if you uh, use one modeling concept, take a state chart, and now you, you take two state charts which describe the same system, just at a different level of abstraction or from a different perspective, then you have to understand how these two state charts can be related. And that's another issue. So you should understand notions like refinement, which is one way to relate uh, different models. Decomposition. Decomposition, as I will show you, is uh, the right direction to introduce structure into the models. And we deal also with what I call the change of scope, and I will explain that during my talk. And we need an extended tool support, which is a different story. I will not talk about that, but what I'm talking about, uh, we do at the same time prototyping tools. Now let's go into what I name basic system modeling concepts. Maybe we start with a picture. It's very important to have an understanding what a system is. So it has to do with a very simple observation in computer science. You should never use terms you don't understand. I shouldn't say that. Maybe you, you are allowed to use terms which you don't understand if you are in the process of understanding a, a, a subject. But then you should work hard until you are at a point where you have a precise understanding of the terms. And only then you should be confident in using those terms. And my advice is if you run around, there are so many people in our field that use buzzwords. And I suggest if you come across a person who uses buzzwords, always ask what the buzzwords mean. Because if we don't understand what they mean, it's very difficult to talk about them. Uh, so I will take a little bit of time to explain what I mean by a system. And of course systems is a very general notion. The notion of system is used in many disciplines. Biology, many other disciplines use the term system. And they use it differently to the way we use it. And therefore I will give you a more computer science or systems engineering 
uh, understanding of the term system and I start with what I call a discrete system and but it can be generalized to other classes of systems and the first thing I'm talking about is what I also call the scope a system has to have a proper boundary if you talk about a system, you first have to decide what is part of the system and what is outside the system. And this gives you a separation of the system and its, we call it, operational context. If you have done that, you immediately come across another interesting notion, which is the notion of an interface. Because if you have defined a scope, now you can ask what is the what is going on between the system and its context. And this is exactly what is happening across the system boundary. You can always call it the interaction between the system and its operational context. And uh, we came up with the idea that even independent of the particular modeling technique you choose, you might uh, think about distinguishing between a syntactic interface of a system and a semantic interface or a system behavior. Uh, and I think a good thing to explain that is a cash machine because we all know cash machines. So a cash machine is a system. If you uh, consider the, the scope of the cash machine exactly what you recognize at the at the outside or the surface of a cash machine, then you have a clear notion of a scope, and and that gives you an interface. And now you can ask what are the syntactic possibilities, what are the principal actions you can do, and then you can, depending on how you abstract it, you can press buttons, you can insert smart cards, you can look at the display, and this gives you the principal ways of interacting. In this principal ways of interacting, uh, you don't understand the logics of the system really. How do you express the logic of the system? Do you express what are the sequences of activities, of interactions uh, that are logical possible? And of course for a cash machine it's quite clear. If, if, you, if you put some input into the cash machine in a well-defined order, then depending on some additional properties are fulfilled, you get money. If you would use those actions in a, in a confused order, nothing interesting would happen with the cash machine. And that's the logic of the, of the uh, interface. And so we talk about interface behavior, which expresses the logic of a machine. And then we have a structure and distribution addressing the internal structure. So this is the outside view of the system. This is the inside view. And we, we were very strict there. We say, if you look inside a system, you have only two interesting questions. What is the architecture? An architecture is a decomposition of the system into a number of internal subsystems. And you can ask what is the state, the state space and the state transitions. And this gives a very simple idea of a system which can be always used to now talk about particular forms of modeling. And of course you could use in addition talk about quality, which I will not do today. And of course you need some data modeling, which I also will not do today because we, I think we know quite well how data modeling is done. Now I give you our uh, system model, which just follows this general idea which I just introduced. And now you see the system here. The system has a boundary and it has a syntactic interface. And the syntactic interface is given by graphically in that case of arrows, but uh, formally this means that you have identifiers which I call channels and each channel has a data type which just expresses which are the data, the messages, the events that can travel along that channel. And we have input channels which are the ingoing errors and output channels which are the outgoing errors. And immediately we have a notion of an interface. And here you see formally the notion of an interface. I describe it by two sets and set I for input which are all the input channels and their types, and a set O for output, which are all the output channels and their type. Together they form the syntactic interface. 
And now let's talk about interface behavior. To be able to talk about interface behavior, we have to introduce the notion of behavior for the channels first. And now to associate a behavior with a channel, we introduce the idea of a stream, which defines a history uh, for a channel. And it's a mapping that takes numbers and maps each number on a sequence of messages where the messages are of the type we have defined for the channels. What is the idea? Well, think about these numbers as representing time, discrete time. Think about time as intervals and each number represents an interval. So we have a first interval, a second interval, a third interval and in each interval on the channel we can send a sequence of messages and this is exactly the sequence of messages we record there. These sequence of messages are very convenient for two reasons. One reason is we immediately can also model a situation where there is no message in a time interval. It can be empty. And it's also an interesting uh, idea that we can now associate with a number a different granularity of time. So a time interval could be one millisecond, it could be a second, could be a microsecond or it could be a week. It's up to you what you are interested to model. And of course that means if you choose a time granularity and you observe a system, then for each time granularity you will get different lengths of sequences because if you just look at a system which reacts not quicker than 10 milliseconds and you would choose the time granularity of a millisecond, what would be the result? Most of the time intervals would be empty because most, in most of the time intervals you observe no message and only a few time intervals would contain only one message. So this is an observation you do if you have a very fine time granularity. Uh, but you can do a refinement, uh, an abstraction, I should say, not a refinement, an abstraction, where you consider a coarser time granularity and then you see on one time interval a long sequence of messages. And it depends what kind of model is good for you, whether one or the other is the better. And having now an idea of uh, a history of a channel, we can also get a history uh, of a set of channels, which just means that for every channel we define uh, such a stream. And this already allows us to talk about behaviors. What is a behavior? It's a mapping that takes an input history and maps it into, I uh, keep it simple to begin with, uh, an output history in the case of a deterministic system. If you're interested to model systems where, which are not fully deterministic, which are non-deterministic, or uh, some people would rather call them underspecified, we allow a set of output histories there. And therefore we have already uh, uh, introduced the behavior and now we can specify behavior and we specify behavior by predicates that talk about uh, input histories and output histories in a logical formula. I, I think it's very important to keep the modeling approach as simple as possible. No category theory, nothing complicated because we want to have simple models and we want to have models which are simple enough that all kinds of engineers from different disciplines are able to deal with them. And therefore, uh, of course, there is more to do if you talk about the theoretical background of what I'm talking about, but it's, it's, I think it's remarkable that in principle on one slide you can explain the idea of an interface behavior of a discrete system. Questions so far? Okay, so let's do the next step. These are discrete systems, yes? Is it uh, interesting to have uh, events that can happen simultaneously in your view? Because I don't see that in your model. Oh, it's, it's, it can happen simultaneously in the sense that you, have, you can have at the same time an input event on this channel and an, uh, an output event on this channel, an input event on this channel and an output event on that channel. What happens on the channels is always in parallel. Right, but but they, they are related by sequence uh, no, 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 no. On each channel, you have uh, such a sequence. So, if you 
if you think about that, then you have, let's just talk about input channels. You have channel X1 and X2. Here you have your time intervals and you could have a message M and M prime and here you could a um, message E and E prime and these this message and these two messages are concurrently or in parallel. Okay? So this is very important. And, and the other thing which is important is you have a model where time is a built-in notion. So you can talk about real-time properties from the very beginning. Um, this is uh, the paper where you can read most of what I talk about here. And now we model interface behavior. This is what I already explained, so I can think I can take go over it. If I'm very careful, I have also to explain that these behaviors have certain properties. I don't explain the property in detail. The idea is very simple. Uh, you assume that the behavior is done in a way that if you look at an output at a certain point of time, it doesn't depend on input which comes later. So we have no way of predicting the future. And this gives also interesting logical uh, properties which we can use in deduction. But I don't want to go into those details. I just want to explain, looking at cyber-physical systems, <coughs> how we could go from there, discrete systems to continuous systems. And it's very simple, because we just choose a different notion of time. Now we go from the natural numbers to the positive reals. And of course we should also consider now data types which have a bit more structure than we assume so far, that we have a continuous uh, possi uh, to expl uh, possibility to, uh, to ex explain uh, continuous properties, so we would have numbers on which we have a kind of a of a, of a topology or something like that, uh, and we immediately get uh, continuous behaviors, which are nothing than continuous streams, and every all other things work exactly the same way. And the nice thing is we could also use it side by side and we get hybrid interfaces. And hybrid interface is an interface where you have jump channels which carry discrete messages and other which just carry continuous messages. And let's do an, a next step. And I just do it now for the discrete part. Let's now think about probability. As I told you, for cyber-physical systems, we are interested in probability because the world it can be studied using probabilities. It, it's difficult to say whether uh, the, the world behaves according to probability, because that's a philosophical question. But there are a lot of situations where it's good to use probability models, and therefore it would be good if our system models could be easily extended into probability. And now uh, it's wonderful, because we just have to introduce, everything is as if we had it, I just have to introduce uh, in addition for the set of possible output histories, a probability distribution. And it's very practical in a certain sense. Uh, for instance, if you model the cash machine, of course a cash machine might, be, uh, might have some faults from time to time. So it could happen that you insert your card and it cannot be read immediately, so you have to try again. Uh, uh, if you model that with a non-deterministic approach, you would say, if I insert a card into a cash machine, and let's assume it's a, it's a valid card, then the cash machine can reply by card readable and accepted, or it can by reply by card not readable, not accepted. From a non-deterministic point of view, it would be two reactions which are equally good. Of course, we would not like have a cash machine where most of the time it, it was not able to read cards. So we would assume that this happens only in 1% of the cases or 0.1% of the cases. And this can be expressed by an interface specification where we express that the probability that the card, uh, a valid card is not readable is below 1%. 
And what is also again remarkable, it's just an extension of the model we have so far. We don't have to change anything. We can study systems from a non-deterministic, underspecified point of view or from a probabilistic point of view. This introduction on, of probabilities in those histories was done by one of my PhDs about two years ago. A very, very nice thesis because if you do all the detailed work, then you of course have to understand the particular rules of probability you have to take care of. And what I really liked with the thesis, this is what I was interested in, that all the nice properties of the models we had so far were maintained when you go into probability. Um, and we could also now try to introduce other notions. We have done one step into space and geometry, but you could also think about temperature and vibration and many other stuff. So you could try to extend those models, some people call it rich models, which talk about all kinds of physical issues. Here you see the PhD I was talking about. So this introduces our key modeling concepts and uh, I would like to emphasize that our key modeling concepts are interface models because I believe that interfaces are the most important modeling aspect we have in computer science. And now look at UML. In UML you don't have a real interface model. You could do some kind of a syntactic interface modeling, but that's not enough. And it's at the same time, UML is not very good in abstraction, because interface means abstraction. And I think this is a key when modeling systems. I give you uh, also some idea how you could, can use logical uh, concepts now to specify systems. This is a system specification. Um, if you rather like graphics, you could also write it in a graphical style. So this is, uh, to begin with, a very simple system. It's a system that has one input channel and one output channel. The input channel is called X, the output channel is called Y. Uh, it, uh, both channels carry the same types of messages. And it's a transmission component, so I call it TMC. And here you see the specification done in a logical style where you have a template which tells you about the input and the output channels and their types. But of course the most interesting part of this part is a logical statement about uh, uh, X and Y. And it's just an abbreviation of a simple predicate logical statement. And of course I have to explain this symbol to you, which is just a general symbol you can use in connections with streams. Uh, this means that it produces, the, as a result, the number of copies of the message M in the stream X. What is a bit difficult is that streams are beasts, they are infinite, infinite and therefore there are cases where you have an infinite number of copies of that message here. But don't be afraid, we can also compare uh, the, this situation and this is only true if this, in X, M is infinitely often and if in Y, M is infinitely often. And the only thing we require that for each message that can be sent according to the data sets T, the, the number of copies in X and Y are the same. And that's the specification. So we do a pure proper uh, property-oriented specification. Is this not too much geared towards discrete event systems? Because I oh yeah, it's, 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 now I'm talking about discrete event systems only. I could, could show you also descriptions of non-discrete event systems, which you could also specify like that. But I keep it simple because otherwise it would take more time to explain. And this gives us now an interesting component because it's a component that has both uh, safety properties and liveness properties. And uh, I invite you to use your favorite specification language to specify a component like that. And uh, you will realize that this is a bit more difficult because it has a kind of a fairness property built inside. Uh, 
this was a component where we didn't talk about time really because we said each message has been reproduced as an output but it can take as long as you like, no restriction. Of course it's easy now to, general, uh, to specify also timing properties and here you see uh, uh, the specification of TMC including timing property where we say that a message that occurs in the input has to occur in the output after at least a number of steps which is indicated by delay. So we can also specify real-time properties. Uh, and this gives us a very flexible model of time. And we can do, deal with time properties in specification, in analysis, in verification. We can transform time. I have already told you the idea. And we can have dedicated models of time with micro macro steps. We can distinguish between system time and physical time. So there are a lot of interesting games you can play with time in this model. But we can also write probabilistic uh, specifications. So this is a specification without going into details, which specifies that the probability that uh, a certain message uh, reaches uh, the deadline and the delay is above 80 percent. So you can also write now probabilistic specification just using the same idea. Um, so far uh, to specification and as Mohammed asked you could also extend that and we did that to hybrid systems and continuous systems but it's a bit more complicated because you have to have the right formulas. I rather now talk about composition. As I told you for cyber physical systems composition is a key and uh, here I usually just talk about the discrete part but it can be extended to the other part. We want to put together two components. Of course we would, would we like to put together many components but if we can compose two we can compose many and here now you see how it works. We say if we compose two components, uh, if the first component has certain output channels which are input channels for the second one, they communicate on them and the same the other way around and we, also, we just have to assume that their data types are consistent. And then we can do the following, giving two specifications of uh, those components. Uh, remember this is the, what I call the interface assertion which describes uh, the properties uh, of the system with respect to the interface in a logical terms. Now we would like to derive from that a specification of the composed system. And what I'm talking about is modularity. If a modeling approach is modular, it has to have the property that from the specifications of the subsystems, you can derive the specification of the composed system without additional information about it. And if you look at the history of uh, modeling techniques in our field, uh, if you look at process algebras, for instance, you see, will see that there are a lot of process algebras which are at least not in the first place are modular. And people had a hard time to make them modular. I show you how the system modeling technique which I talk about is modular. This is the specification of the composed system. You take the two interface assertions and you put them together by logical AND, by logical conjunction, and you hide the internal channel by existential quantification. Which is nice because now you have a, a direct translation of the physical idea of composition into logics. Channel hiding by existential quantification, parallel composition by logical AND, which is a, a very interesting and useful way to do that because it means that you immediately can do proofs about a composed system from the properties of the subsystem. So it's very powerful. And of course you have to prove that such an approach gives uh, a consistent logical approach to that, which I will not show you, but I can assure you that we have done all that proofs to be sure that what we can do that way is really valid. And now we can deal with architectures. We can 
have an architecture which would look like this uh, and we put this together this is a composition operator for the uh, systems, subsystems involved we can derive an architecture specification which is just the logical end of all the interface assertions of these components and we can now prove architecture correctness if we have a sysspec for the overall system correctness means that from the properties of the components we can prove the property of the system which we are interested in and that means that you get a complete logical go so besides this modeling idea which I've introduced you can now get a complete way of doing logical um, deduction now we can refine interfaces uh, we have two forms of refinement I don't have the time to go into details I just wanted to give you the idea uh, uh, property refinement or horizontal refinement is a fact where we in principle we can do it a bit more complicated but in principle we just add properties so we have a system with a interface assertion and we make the interface assertion stronger vertical refinement is a bit more complicated because it allows you to relate systems which work at different granularities of time or different granularity of interaction it can be nicely explained with the cache machine again if you have a cache machine there is a situation where you have to insert a pin and now if you model that you have two possibilities you can model that by inserting a pin means five interactions if you have a, uh, a four digit pin and a symbol which tells the machine that now the pin is finished you have you press five buttons and you would have five input messages at that level of event granularity but of course at a more logical level you say I don't care whether a pin has four digits and that these are individual interactions I see the pin as one interaction at an abstract level this is what I want to see and now we could now um, describe the interface behavior of a cache machine at these different granularities and vertical refinement allows you to prove that these different granularity levels are refinement of each other and that gives you a very powerful approach of that and this is just the idea here you see uh, the details the horizontal refinement is simple you just introduce the notion that all the behaviors of the refined systems are subset of the behaviors of the other system what is interesting again is compositional modularity if you refine components of an architecture you get the refinement of the system described by that architecture uh, verification of refinement is simple it's just implication between the assertions and here you see that refinement is also a nice way of I introducing the notion of compatibility which is of a lot of practical importance so far I did not talk about implementation really also you could say architecture is a step into implementation because it's a step into design but I didn't talk about uh, really operational implementation uh, well state machines are a good way to do that and now bear with me I'm now getting a bit faster because I think state machine are well known to you so I give you just the idea uh, system have states a state is an element of a defined state space we can define state spaces by defining state attributes and their values and now we consider a particular state machine which is a Moore machine or more general a generalized mealy machine which is in its core a state transition function which is a mapping that takes a state and now you see this is exactly what happens in one time interval on the input channels so it, it uh, associates with each input channel a sequence of messages and the result of a state transition is, a, is a, the, the, the next state and, an, and what is shown as the output on the output channels and that's the idea 
And then you can describe systems by those state machines. You can use a kind of a graphical notation for that. Here it's just explained what computations are and so on. Maybe this is important which I should point out. If you have a state machine that's a state machine with a particular set of initial states, then you can define an abstraction here on that and the abstraction is an interface behavior. So you have a clear understanding how a state machine relates to an interface behavior. And then you can uh, show that if these state machines have the property that they don't predict the future, you go in the direction of Moore machines and you have no introduced the notion of uh, execution and operation at state machines. And so we have all what we had seen as my parts of a system. We have seen a, a modeling of interface behavior, of architecture, and of state machines. And we have a clear understanding how they relate because every state machine defines an interface behavior. If you take an architecture, you can put together uh, the interface behaviors of the subsystems in the architecture and calculate from that a behavior of the composed system. Uh, here you see that we also can define composition for two-state machines. Again, I don't read the formulas for you. What's interesting is this formula. It's, it says the following. Given two-state machines, which I compose in parallel, and then I do the interface abstraction. This gives the same as doing the interface abstraction for the state machines first, and then composing the interfaces. This looks a very terrible theoretical formula. Why is it of high practical importance? But you, you can break the system, decompose it. Sorry? You can decompose the system and you can uh, divide it and compare it with the Yeah, and you have the freedom either to work at the level of state machines or at the level of interface and it makes no difference. So it gives the engineer the freedom to choose between different representations of the system, which for practical purposes is very important. I don't go over this conclusion. I will be very fast on that. I just give you the idea. Uh, we are working a lot with automotive industry. And if you look in a car today, you realize something which you realize for a lot of cyber-physical systems. Cyber-physical systems are often multifunctional. What I mean by that, I think most of you have smartphones. The smartphone is the ultimate multifunctional system because with the smartphone you can do many things. You can, can listen to radio, you call, can go on the internet, you can play games, you can use it as alarm clock, and in case you can even use it as a telephone. Uh, the remarkable thing is that it, has, it is a bundle of functionality. The same is, by the way, true for a car. A car today is a multifunctional system because it offers a lot of functionality. Um, in principle, you can understand smartphones and cars by using this notion of a system which I've introduced and trying to describe a car or a smartphone by giving an interface specification. <laughs> Imagine to write an interspecification for nowadays car. Would be a rather large formula. I'm not sure whether a human would be able to write this formula in his lifetime. So we need structure. Uh, what can we do? Well, an idea would be we decompose the functionality, the interface behavior of a car, into a number of sub-functions. Be careful, uh, there's a big difference between a subsystem decomposition and a sub-function decomposition. And we decompose it into a number of functions in our approach. <coughs> this would be like that. Now we have two functions, independent functions, and we put them side by side, and this gives us a multifunctional system. However, life is not so simple because the functions in a car are not independent to each other. A good example is a telephone in a car, integrated, and a radio. 
in principle, the telephone and the radio are completely different devices and different functionalities. But nevertheless, they influence each other because if a telephone call comes in, the radio will be turned down. And this is called a feature interaction between these functional features. So our telephone and our radio are not so independent as we would think in the first step. Well, in our case it's not so difficult because what we suggest is to introduce what we call modes. And now such a mode, let's say this is a telephone mode, a telephone, and then the mode, a telephone uses a mode that tells the radio to turn down uh, while you're doing the telephone conversation. And this allows us to now have a way of putting together a large system with a multifunctional behavior from a number of subsystems and that can be done even by refinement. We construct from a given isolated function uh, a refinement which is a bit more general than property refinement as I introduced it where we can also now talk about the behavior depending on modes and then we can compose the system. Uh, if you like to uh, see that for a larger system the idea would be to say uh, I decompose my system in a function hierarchy and we have studied that for a number of real systems and in a car for instance you have about 4,000 systems uh, 4,000 functions which you can decompose like that so this is a car it looks not exactly like a car but from a fu structured functionality this is a car and here you have 4,000 functions like that if you like, you could uh, represent each function by a state machine. Now it's an interesting question, how much would they cost? See, state machines are not so large anymore. They just describe a braking system, the automatic window, the telephone, stuff like that. Maybe even not the telephone, but even the sub-decomposition decomposition of telephones. These can be described either by state interface assertions or they can be described by state machine. Now, let's do a little calculation. How much time would it take to write such a function? Well, well a few days they could write it. So, let's just calculate it in a simple way. Let's assume it takes a thousand euros uh, to specify such a function. You have 4,000 functions, so it means that it takes 4 million euros to specify the functionality of a car. Or maybe 1,000 euros is a bit uh, too cheap. Let's take 10,000 euros. So it takes 40 million to specify the functionality of a car. Is that economic? Is it worthwhile to do it that way? It's quite clear that it is. Because if you look at the amount of uh, effort that goes into the design of a car, it would be wonderful to have such a thing and I will show you later a little bit why. Uh, now you can have this functional decomposition of a system and you can now describe in this approach the dependencies between the requirements which are just statements about the system if you like you can talk about think about them as interface assertions a functional decomposition and a architectural decomposition and it allows you also to relate that this is what some people would call tracing but it goes even beyond what is called tracing in, in, in practice today so we could ask if we have a requirement which function is involved in that requirement and which subsystem that uh, is part of the architecture contributes to this property which is expressed here. So it gives a very logical understanding of systems. Model integration is simple, we have already talked about that, I just give you a picture. Model integration means interfaces, architecture and state machines. And these are fully integrated in the approach I was talk I'm talking about because we can do an interface abstraction for an architecture and we get an interface behavior. We can do an interface abstraction for a state machine and we get an interface behavior. How are these two related? What is the relationship between an architecture and a state machine? Well, if you give state machines for each of the components, then we have a composition of state machines, which I didn't explain but just showed to you. 
and the result we get a large composed state machine. So we can use them also in an integrated way. So we can describe a system at the same time as an architecture and as a state machine, which is very useful because then we can use different techniques for that. And we can enhance the whole by probability. I didn't show that because we don't only have notion for probability for the interfaces, but also for the architecture and for the state machine. So we can have a, have a probabilistic model of the architecture, which is also very helpful for functional safety, for instance. And uh, I think I will end up with this slide, which takes a few minutes. Do I still have a few minutes? Which now gives you the idea how you can develop systems according to that. It's a bit of a Mickey Mouse uh, explanation, but it's very serious because it's not so far away from practice than people might think. So now let's develop a system. Let's develop a cash machine. Uh, we start with informal requirements. So we talk to a lot of stakeholders and collect all the informal requirements. And now I'm just talking about functional properties and then we write a functional specification. This is a functional specification. Uh, if I talk, think about it from a theoretical point of view, we just give, we describe the system scope, the syntactic interface and give an interface assertion. Uh, if you think about it in a bit more practical style, we would perhaps not write just an interface assertion, but rather uh, do a functional decomposition and having such a function hierarchy and describes the system by specifying all its functions, which together again give an interface specification for the overall system. That's fine. Now we go on. Uh, just to explain what we in principle do here, we just talk about the interaction between the system and its environment in the sense of what are the input from the outside and what is the output to the outside. Now going on, we do a design. Design is giving an architecture, it could be much more complicated like that, but for a cache machine, this could be the display, this could be the keyboard, and this could be the money cassette or whatever you like. Subsystems that work together. Now, the important part is if you do it properly, you give interface assertions for all of those, and now you have to think about the correctness of the architecture. And the correctness of the architecture means if you compose these three components, you get a behavior with properties that imply the properties in the system specification. What does that tell us? If we do that, we can prove the correctness of an architecture before we have built the system. Which is not true in practice today. In practice today, people would not describe that in, in all detail. But let's come back to that later. Let's just continue with our, implement, uh, with our development. Uh, by the way, what we do is we go from this abstract view on this view where we don't only talk about what is the interaction at the system boundary, but we also talk about what's going on inside the system, which is exactly what happens today. If you, if you insert a card in a cash machine, this means that a lot of communication may go on between the different parts of the cash machine until the cash machine comes up with the output and telling you card is valid and accepted. By the way, if you do it like that, we could do it really in a, in, a, in a methodological way. You could discover the behavior of the components from this behavior uh, of the architecture of the components working together. But now let's go on to the implementation. Implementation means that we give implementation for each of the components. These implementations we give for each of the components, uh, of course, have to obey the interface specifications we have written here. And verification means that we prove that the implementation of each of the components implies the specification. 
think about the implementation of each of the components as state machines. State machines define an interface behavior uh, that corresponds to an assertion, an interface assertion, so or the corresponding interface assertion must be in a way that we can prove the properties of the interface assertion here, uh, used to prove the properties of the specification. So we have a components implementation. And now of course we can go on, we put together our system, which means we go to the integration, we put that together. Now we get a composed system composed of the realization of the components. And now we have to show the correctness of the overall system in the delivery step. System verification means that from the composed system, composed of the implementation, we have to prove the properties of the system specification. Do, do we have to prove anything here? Yeah, if we have proved this, and we have proved this, and if our approach is modular, then this is just a direct corollary of what we have done there. Which from a practical point of view is a very simple thing. If you have a correct architecture, and if each of the components of the architecture is correctly implemented, then you have a correct system. If I give this talk in front of people from industry, they get very nervous at that point. Because it, is a, it cannot be true, because usually they take half of their effort to do the integration. So what's wrong? Well, if you, if you look at practice, what people are doing is the following. Say, don't write proper specifications they don't write proper architecture specification. So there is no way to do that proof. Since they don't have proper architecture specification, they do not even have a proper description of what a subsystem should do. So doing an implementation is always a little bit just uh, aiming at a moving target. And when you do the integration, then you discover everything what is wrong in your implementation step, everything is what is wrong in your architecture, and even what is wrong in your specification. And therefore the integration is a big debugging of what you have done so far. And the interesting question is, what do you gain if you do it the way I explained it to you? which is also called front-loading, where you put much more energy in specifying the system, the architecture, and allowing verification at least also at these levels and save a lot of time in the integration. And by the way, it's not so theoretical as you think, because uh, I just explained to you, we could even describe the system specification by uh, a set of state machines. A set of state machines is nice because we can simulate that. So if we do that, we could even simulate the interface behavior of the system at the level of the specification. The next step would be that we do the architecture by giving state machines for the components, abstract state machines. Then we could even do a verification by tests because we can generate tests from here and test it at that level and so on. So it, it, it's much more uh, practical as people might think and it would save a lot of problems we have in practice. And I know that these problems are there in practice. I did, uh, I supervised a PhD some years ago for a German, large German car supplier. And the idea was we find out what are the number of bugs in architecture design in cars on the street. And this guy had the chance to go to their archives and worked three, four months in the archives to look at certain bugs they found in, uh, on the street. And when he came back and I said, how many are architectural bugs? He said, I don't know. Because the architecture is not described well enough to distinguish for a bug whether it's a component bug or an architecture bug. And of course this shows you how difficult life is. I think due to time I go over this because it just shows you also how this can be, be made more applied. And I just talk shortly about the triad of modeling that I, what I did in the beginning. 
you need a denotational modeling approach, understanding the concept of models by giving a mathematical uh, denotational description of that. You need a logical approach, which has to fit together, where you talk about the properties of your mathematical model and you need a notational approach, which gives you a nice way of representing such behaviors. And now we are finished. Uh, what I have introduced is a modeling frame which we, we called FOCUS some time ago, uh, where we have worked on for many years now. We have a tool, Autofocus, if you are interested you can find it on the web and you can download it and do your uh, experiments with it. And we have applied this approach to many uh, domains, but also to a number of classical systems like we were very much influenced by STL, which was an old specification language in telecommunication, by the way, interaction diagrams were invented around SDL. We have uh, modeled bus systems in cars. Uh, we have studied UML, SysML, and about all what is missing there, and currently are working to use the same approach to define service-oriented architectures. Thank you very much. Okay, we have uh, time for one or two questions before we go to the coffee break. Yes. Uh, so uh, you mentioned this way of composing a very complicated model for a car, to make it simpler. So, are you aware of any car manufacturer that has done this? And if so, how did it affect the cost of building? We are working with a number of car manufacturers on that. The car manufacturer, we, I think, uh, is most advanced on that is a truck company where we have the pleasure that they are very close by Munich, which is MIN, uh, which you might know as a car company. Uh, and, and they, we are working for, with them now for more than 10 years, and they had similar ideas, but much more from a pragmatic side. When they approached us and <laughs> when we talked first time to each other, uh, we came uh, both to the conclusion that we said what we are doing at the university is the theoretical and scientific counterpart of what they tried to do from a more practical point of view. And now we have a lot of experience. We had also done the decomposition of a, not of the whole car because uh, four, four million dollars is a much, is a bit too much for us, but we have taken quite large subsystems with a, with a I think, with several I think we had one example with 40 or 60 functions where we did the decomposition and studied all the, the relationships there and it looks like that it works in practice quite well. And we have other car manufacturers which use the idea but it's very difficult to introduce such ideas in a large organization and so it takes a little bit of time. I was thinking, so you, you have the architecture and you have the logical formula that yeah. describes the yeah. semantics of the interface yeah. and then you have these state machines that you call implementation. But typically you would like to do implementation in something that is higher. I mean, state machines from a programming perspective are very low level. You would like to prefer in the higher level instrument. Is that true? Well, I guess, I mean, in state machines you parameters and uh, types for the parameters and function calls. I mean, there are ways of modularizing things that are higher level than state machines. That's an interesting question. Uh, all what you said about state machines, which is low level, you find in programming languages too, by the way. Uh, I, I'd rather think about that, which is a bit influenced by the work we did long time ago on SDL. Uh, this was at a time where Siemens was still in telecommunications. And they were describing their telecommunication system by SDL. SDL has a, has a I didn't like so much the way it was uh, coded in SDL, but in principle they had a kind, it was not really state machines, it was rather control flow diagrams. But the idea was they had control flow diagrams and they had statements in the control flow diagrams, but these statements were described by large programs. So I had a program language chill at that time, and so they had a mixture of that. And we understand what we are doing very much like that because um, if you talk about interactive system, interaction is the key. And so uh, 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 a mealy machine 
is really geared towards describing the interaction. And uh, since if you have complicated state machines, certainly in one state transition a lot of stuff happens. Mm. Then of course you could use programs to describe what's happening inside such a state machine. Actually we generate from the state machine programs and the way I like to think about is uh, that uh, what I showed you is rather at a level of course design or at the level of system design and if you have then a component it's a large unit mm. and if you want to really then to program it then you write a, a fine design maybe by object orientation or whatever which explains now the behavior of such a component in terms of a program mm. but what we do in our tool we write the state machines and we generate from the state machines code and which is by the way uh, we, we see that also in, in industry uh, now a number of companies are going that way and they are quite they are quite satisfied with it uh, but the, the, the question which you, uh, uh, which you ask is a very interesting one, which has really has to be discussed a little bit longer. Is a state machine less or more abstract and does it offer better or not so good structuring compared with classical programming languages? Okay, maybe one last question before. Yeah, um, I think one thing that you mentioned was very interesting that you have these channels that are independent of each other and not synchronized to each other. Mm. But when you receive uh, information from two channels that are not synchronized in a component, you need to coordinate them somehow, and you didn't describe that. And that's the only thing that I saw that was dealing with that was the interaction diagrams that you showed. Yeah. No, no, this is a... Uh, uh, Can you explain? This is, this is, a, this is a, Sorry? Maybe you can repeat the question. Oh, I'm sorry. I should repeat the question. Uh, the, the question is now, how do you synchronize the messages that uh, you receive as independent input on independent channels? That was the question, right? And, and the point is, yes, you are right. In some sense, if you look a little bit more in detail about the semantic model, uh, I didn't go into these details, you use Moore machines. Moore machine means that uh, you produce output, now let's uh, add to this little diagram, these are the input channels, let's add one output channel, that you pr and, and if you think about it as a state machine, of course you now you could have a state, so you are in a situation, you have this state, you have this input, and you have this output. Now let's take the first time interval, we have the first state, we have this as input and we produce the output and the output in a Moore machine may depend only on that state. So this state determines the output we get here. So it means that just one channel changes to change the state. And now the input you have here at each of the input channels together with the state we have here defines the next state. So in a certain sense, it's a, it's a little bit, if you know STRL, it's a little bit like STRL. You collect all the input in one time interval, and then in the next time interval you get a new state, which depends on all the different input on the channels, and there you do also the orchestration or synchronization. So you really can put them together. What you cannot do uh, for a number of reasons is that you produce instantaneous output because then you get in, can exact into the problem you were talking about. So in a certain sense, this is a machine which always works with one-time unit delay. But if you work with this one-time unit delay, then you have the full possibility to get, to look at all the input you get on the different channels and to produce from this the next state. Okay? Okay, uh, I can imagine there are many more questions in the audience, so I propose to take them during the coffee break. I would like to thank you for the very inspiring uh, talk. Thank you. And we had a tradition of thanking oh. our speaker for this whole Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>